Dr. Sudhir has completed his MBBS from Tutukudi Medical College and uh, DNB Orthopedic Surgery from Ganga Hospital, Coimbatore, MNAMS in 2012, FNB Spinal Surgery uh, from Gangaram Hospital, New Delhi, Spine Surgery Fellowship from Queen Medical Center, Nottingham, and Fellowship in Endoscopic Fine Surgery from St. Anna Hospital, uh, Germany. He's a recipient of many awards, uh, prominently being a Balu Shankaran Gold Medal Award for uh, All India First Rank and DNB, Dr. Ashish Mukherjee Gold Medal Award from Gangaram Hospital, Dr. Vyagareshwar Gold Medal from Tamil Nadu Orthopedic Association, Dr. Srivatsava Gold Medal from Indian Orthopedic Association, Best Paper of Delhi Orthopedic Association, Best Poster Award from Misicon and Asicon, that is Minimal Invasive Spine Surgery and Association of Spine Surgeries. And uh, presently, he's working as a consultant spine surgeon in Ramchandra Medical College and various other hospitals in Chennai. Uh, this month being uh, Scoliosis Awareness Month, uh, it will be a good topic uh, uh, for him to present uh, this uh, scoliosis. Over to you, Dr. Sudhir. Yeah, uh, thank you, Dr. Sandeep, for the introduction. So I'll share my screen now. I hope you are able to see my screen. Is it visible? Is my screen visible? Yes, sir, visible, sir. Yeah. Visible. visible, please go ahead. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Uh, at the outset, uh, I would like to thank the uh, IMA Kodambakam branch for giving me this opportunity uh, to present this topic. Uh, and I'm Dr. Sudhir, consultant spine surgeon, uh, practicing in uh, Ramchandra Institute and various other hospitals in Chennai. And uh, today I'll be throwing an insight uh, about scoliosis. So we all know that uh, scoliosis is actually uh, one of the conditions which is underdiagnosed and uh, it is one of the conditions which is undertreated basically because of the complexity of the problem as such, as well as because of the complex of the treatment modalities which is involved in treating scoliosis. In regards to this, the Scoliosis Research Society, uh, International Society has regarded the month of June as the Scoliosis Awareness Month. So I thought this would be the right time to uh, present uh, and uh, to give a few facts about scoliosis in this forum. So definition-wise, scoliosis is a three-dimensional rotational deformity of the spine. So basically, uh, when you see the given X-ray, you can see that the spine is not straight. Whenever we are visualizing an individual in an X-ray, the spine has to be straight in the coronal view. That is, when you are viewing the patient from the front or from the back, the spine is a straight structure. Whenever there is a rotational deformity with curvature in the spine, it is defined as scoliosis. And technically or scientifically, it is defined when the curvature is greater than 10 degree, when it is measured by something called as the Cobb's angle, which I will be discussing it later. Now we have to know about the types of scoliosis. So the commonest type of scoliosis is compensatory scoliosis, which could be due to some kind of discal problem or uh, which could be because of uh, nerve root irritation, or it could be because of limb length discrepancies or hip pathology or pelvis pathology. The next step is congenital type of scoliosis, which could be due to failure of formation or failure of segmentation because of some uh, effects during embryogenesis. And or it could be syndromic and it is associated with other syndromes like Marfan syndrome, Heller-Danlos syndrome, etc. Or it could be because of neuromuscular causes, which could be either neuropathic or myopathic, like in cerebral palsy and conditions associated like that. The most commonest type of scoliosis which we will come across as physicians are, uh, is the idiopathic type of scoliosis in which the cause is not known in most of the cases. This idiopathic scoliosis can again be divided or classified into infantile, juvenile or adolescent. Again, amongst these three types, adolescent idiopathic scoliosis is the commonest type of scoliosis. And most of the scoliosis which are, we are discussing and which we will be treating in our clinic and in, the, in our uh, hospital is adolescent idiopathic scoliosis. Dr. Sudhir, can you un unmute yourself, sir?
yeah it came as uh, someone muted and asked me to unmute anyway i have unmuted myself so the infantile scoliosis usually presents less than 3 years of age the juvenile scoliosis presents between 3 to 10 years of age and the adolescent type which is the commonest type presents greater than 10 years of age it is basically the age of presentation however the international societies they uh, came up with uh, later came up with another classification which is the most important classification whether it is an early onset of it presents less than 5 years of age or it is termed as late onset if the child presents greater than 5 years of age it is basically because of the fact that the alveolar development in the lungs takes about 8 years for complete maturation and whenever there is any deformity in the spine along with the chest wall deformity because of the rotational element it can compromise the space which is available for the alveoli and for the lungs which can cause respiratory issues for the child so this is a uh, chart uh, the most important thing which i want to mention in this chart is as i said adolescent scoliosis is very common and right sided scoliosis is very common and it is commonly seen in girls so that is very very important scoliosis the adolescent type is usually commonly seen in girls now whenever a patient is coming to us the first and more, foremost important thing in scoliosis is proper history we have to ask what is when when was the onset because usually the child would not have noticed and since the adolescent scoliosis uh, it presents about 10 years of age usually they will not expose their body to others or even to their parents so they usually present to us at a later date whenever there is severe drooping of shoulder or severe elevation of one shoulder compared to the other so the onset is important the duration of scoliosis is important progression is very very important we have to ask them over the period of 6 months or over the period of past one year how the scoliosis has progressed if it is going to be a rapid progression then it requires serious attention and in case of congenital scoliosis especially we have to ask about the antenatal natal and postnatal history in case of girls the time of menarche is very very important because as it is a deformity as it is a deformity and it involves the spine there will be usually a sudden exaggeration of the deformity during the growth spurt which happens between 11 to 14 years especially in girls at the time before and just after menarche so the uh, time of menarche is very very important suppose if the child comes to us at 11 years of age and we are assessing and the scoliosis curve is slightly better and the child hasn't attained menarche we have to warn them that there will be a sudden exaggeration of the deformity during menarche and the history of pain is very very important we have to understand that most of the times 90% of the times scoliosis is a cosmetic problem and very rarely the child will present with pain whenever there is history of pain with associated with scoliosis it is a red flag and it has to be evaluated immediately with all modalities of investigation and neurological examination again having uh, said that that uh adolescent scoliosis is very very common usually these children will be neurologically absolutely intact whereas in congenital scoliosis we have to examine for neurology because there will be underlying spinal dystrophisms like mening meningocele uh, or diastomatomalia or tethered cord syndromes which has to be ruled out so these are the telltale signs especially in case of congenital scoliosis to rule out some intraspinal whenever we come across this we have to rule out some intraspinal anomalies now how do you examine a patient with scoliosis always scoliosis is always examined with uh, us the doctor standing behind the patient the first and foremost thing is to see whether the head is centered over the pelvis or not this is very very important suppose if you are finding a deformity in the spine and the head is centered over the center of pelvis it means that it is a well compensated curve and the next most important sign and the next most uh, common symptom with which a patient or the parents will come to us is elevation of shoulder they will say that there is drooping of shoulder on one side basically it is elevation of shoulder on the convex side of the curve so whenever there is elevation of shoulder it has to ring a bell again the level of scapula we have to look at the level of scapula similar to the shoulder the level of scapula will be elevated on the convex side then elevation of the iliac crest again there will be compensatory curve see our body is a phenomenal structure as we all know that it will try to compensate for whatever mishappenings that is happening in the body so whenever there is a curve which is developing in the spine the body itself will contract the curve uh, and it will form a compensatory curve uh, in order uh, that the pelvis and the individual stands erect then we have to look for the location of the curve the most common location is the thoracic region especially in adolescent idiopathic scoliosis so we have to locate the curve and then we have to know 
the type of the curve. What is the type? So I'll be discussing the type, whether it is a thoracic type or thoracolumbar type or a proximal thoracic type, all those things. The next thing is arm thorax distance. As you can see in the picture, the arm thorax distance on the convex side of the curve will be very much reduced. And as time goes by, it will be there will be a significant asymmetry with gross increased arm thorax distance on the concave side, which means the severity of the curve is very uh, much and it is very severe. Then coming to the head and shoulder balance, we have to look at the angle of the eye and again at the angle of the clavicle. If it is again elevated, again it means that it is a significant and a symptomatic curve. The one thing which we should not forget is examination from the lateral aspect to know the sagittal alignment of the spine. Usually scoliosis is associated with uh, reduced kyphosis. Normally we should have a kyphosis that is uh, the picture show, uh, which is depicted here shows an exaggerated kyphosis, but normally the kyphosis should be less. In case of congenital scoliosis, there will be usually hypo, I mean kyphos scoliosis, the kyphosis will be exaggerated. Whereas in adolescent scoliosis, the kyphosis will be reduced because as I said, because of the rotational component, the lateral view of the spine will become, tend to become the AP view of the spine. The next most important uh, sign which we have to elicit is the forward bending test. By this, we will be able to catch about 99% of the children having scoliosis. Even if we have a mild amount of scoliosis, because of the rotational deformity, the ribs will tend to rotate and there will be crowding of ribs and rib hump which is formed. So when you ask the child to bend forward with knees extended and try to touch the floor, you can see a bump clearly, which is basically because of the rib being pushed posteriorly. And if you, if you have scoliometer, it is very important to measure the amount of uh, the trunk rotation using the scoliometer. And now the Association of uh, Spine Surgeons of India have uh, come up with something called as a spine scoli check. It is an app which will be rolling out in the uh, month of August. So we have regional centers and Chennai is one of the regional centers and I'm one of the regional members for scoliosis screening and we'll be doing a pilot study for scoliosis screening because Scoliosis is one condition which is usually diagnosed at school by the teachers. Abroad, everywhere, scoliosis screening is being done routinely and regularly and the data is being maintained. However, in our country, this is the first time which we are going to start and we are going to start in the metro cities. And by next month, we'll be getting this fine scoli check wherein the school can uh, uh, log in or the parents can log in and they can take pictures if they have doubt they can take pictures of their child we will be having a demo of how to take pictures and it will be uploaded in the website and as regional members will go through that and then we'll contact them to say whether the child needs follow-up or it is nothing to worry about so this is one of the landmark and milestone uh, of uh, and by the association of spine surgeons of india coming to examination part we have to examine the gate Hip joint, as I said, scoliosis can be because of some hip joint pathology and it could be because of some limb length uh, discrepancies because the spine will tend to balance or compensate for the limb length discrepancy or the pelvic discrepancies and neurological examination. So the one thing which we have to differentiate between scoliosis is the list. So there is a terminology called as list, which is often called a sciatic list. How to differentiate? Sciatic list is a condition which usually presents because of compression of a particular nerve root. Uh, it is basically because the body tends to shift uh, itself to reduce the pressure on the nerve root because of the compression by disc. So the shoulder will usually be uh, balanced over the pelvis in case of scoliosis. As I said, most of them there will be compensatory curves and they will be compensated. Whereas in list, the trunk will be totally shifted outwards from the pelvis. And uh, scoliosis is a painless condition, whereas sciatic list, they will give history of back pain with severe radicular pain most of the times. Neurological deficit can be present in sciatic list. So this is one boy who is 15 years old who was being evaluated for scoliosis, uh, looking at the deformity, various x-rays uh, were done and, they were, and he was told that it needs just follow up. And in the x-ray, you can see there is, the line is not straight, there is some tilt. However, if you see the pedicles, that is the eye-like structures on either sides. It is even. That means there is no rotation. And when MRI was done, when the patient came to me, MRI was done and it showed a very significant L2-3 disc prolapse causing severe forward stoop with sciatic list for which we, he underwent surgery. Now coming to the x-rays and how, what, what all we have to see in the x-ray when we come across scoliosis because x-ray is one of the most important modality 
uh, for treating and uh, diagnosing scoliosis. So it has to be a full length X-ray. Most of the times we tend to cut off the X-ray. We should not take only the thoracic region. As far as possible, we should try to stitch the images or when you have the facility to take a full length X-ray, it is always preferable. It has to cover from C1 or at least from C7 to S1 or S2. Similarly, lateral view, you have to have the entire view. The other views which we are bothered about as uh, surgeons is the side bending films because the by bending towards the side or towards the convexity of the curve, we will know how much the curve is uh, getting corrected and it shows the flexibility of the curve, which is very, very important for uh, uh, taking decisions regarding the treatment. So it has to be a right side bending view and the left side bending view. So you can see on bending the scoliosis is almost getting corrected in this case. And traction film, uh, I routinely use it just before surgery to know again about the amount of correction which is uh, possible. Because uh, the bare minimum amount of correction which you can uh, get in a scoliosis patient intraoperatively is almost equal to the amount of correction which you get in a traction film. Now, CSVL. So the, the main thing which you have to see is there are a few lines. I'm not getting into the intricate details, but basically it is to know whether the child is compensated or not in the AP view. The central sacral venous line is drawn through the center of the spinous process of the sacrum. And the C7 plumb line is a straight vertical line drawn from the, dropped from the C7 spinous process. Usually, normally these two lines should overlap or it should be less than two centimeters. When it is more than that, it means the child is decompensated. Similarly, in the lateral view, when you drop a line from the center of C7 body, it should pass through the posterior superior corner of S1 vertebra, which means the global alignment of the spine is normal. If it is passing less than five centimeter posteriorly, again, it is good. Whereas if it is passing anterior more than 5 cm, it means the spine is unbalanced and the child is getting decompensated. Now, coming to the assessment of rotation, the key point here is you have to look the eye-like structures, that is the pedicles. In AP view, the, both the pedicles should be visible very clearly and it should be of equal size. Whenever there is discrepancy in the size of the pedicle, it means the vertebra is getting rotated. Basically, it is a rotational component. It's a three-dimensional rotational deformity. The next thing is you have to examine the child for tanner's grading for the pubertal signs and razor grade. Basically, it is the ossification of iliac apophysis. This is very, very important to reassure the patient and to explain the patient about the prognosis, whether the curve will progress or not, whether when do you have to undertake surgery and all those things. Because rises grade zero or grade one means early stages of skeletal maturity. As the child goes to grade four or grade five, the chances of progression of the curve is very, very less. Now, coming to few basic uh, terminologies, there is something called as N vertebra. N vertebra, as the name denotes, it means the end of the curve. So the vertebra which marks the end of the curve is called as the N vertebra, which is the vertebra which gets maximally tilted into the concavity of the curve, and it is the least rotated vertebra. So basically in a curve, the top and end portion of the curve is termed as the end vertebra, and the rotation in this vertebra will be very, very less. Whereas the apical vertebra, as the name denotes, it is the apex of the curve and it is the most laterally deviated vertebra and most rotated one. Stable vertebra is a vertebra which is closely bisected by the CSVL, as I already pointed out, the central sacral vertical line, which is the most important line. That is, it is almost like the center of the body and the vertebra, which is most likely, I mean, which is mostly bisected by this line is called as the stable vertebra. This vertebra is very, very important in uh, making treatment decisions because when you are fixing the spine, you have to involve the stable, include the stable vertebra in the fixation. Otherwise, the child may decompensate after surgery. And the neutral vertebra, as I said, the vertebra without any rotation is termed as the neutral vertebra. And the most important thing is when we look at x-ray, when we suspect scoliosis, the next Thing which we can do is measuring the Cobb's angle, which will actually determine the treatment modality. So it is measured by two lines. The first line is a line drawn along the superior border of the upper end vertebra, and the bottom line is a line drawn along the inferior border of the inferior end vertebra, and this angle is termed as the Cobb's angle. Now, as I said, when we are coming across a child with scoliosis, usually there will be 
two or three curves and very rarely we'll come across with a single curve in adolescent scoliosis. Whereas in neuromuscular scoliosis, usually it will be a single large curve. So when do you call it as a major curve? Whenever the Cobb's angle is more, suppose if a curve is 90 degree and the other curve is 60 degree, obviously the major curve is a curve with 90 degree. And the curve with uh, lesser degree is the minor curve. There is another confusing fact here that is structural and non-structural curve. See, uh, structural curves are curves that do not correct completely or the Cobb's angle should be greater than 25 degree in side bending views. Any curve with Cobb's angle greater than 20 degree, 25 degree in side bending view, it is termed as structural curve. It is very, very important because structural curves that are highly they're unlikely to revert back to normalcy. And even when you are advocating surgery, the structural curves should be included in the fixation and fusion. And any curve with Cobb's angle less than 25 degree in side bending view, it is termed as non-structural. So let us get into a case example. This is a kid, a 14 year old kid who came with triple curve, three curves. The major curve as per the measuring, you can see 100 degrees of thoracic curve and the minor curves are proximal thoracic and a lumbar curve. So this child has almost like a snake-like spine. The structural and non-structural curves cannot be determined based on this. So you have to determine only after getting side bending views. So after side bending view, it was found that the structural curve is the thoracic and proximal thoracic because on side bending, the lumbar curve comes to 5 degrees. It is less than 25 degrees. So it becomes a non-structural curve. Hence, you need not include all the five lumbar vertebra during instrumentation. Because lumbar vertebra, as far as possible, lumbar levels, we should try to save. Last few slides. Coming to the treatment outline. So this is a gross outline of how to go about treatment of adolescent idiopathic scoliosis. I'm not getting into other types of scoliosis. So basically, we can divide into skeletally mature and skeletal mature. When the cobs is less than 20 degree, you need not do anything. The child doesn't even recover a brace. Just observe the kid till skeletally, skeletal maturity and do x-rays every six months. Reassure the parents. If it is between 20 to 40 degree, then definitely give the child a brace. The one pro main problem with bracing is... If at all, if you are going to give a brace, it has to be a proper custom-made brace which gives proper pressure uh, at the appropriate pressure points. And it has to be worn for about at least 22 to 23 hours. Only then the brace will work. Even during sleep, the child has to wear the brace except during toileting purposes. So it is very, very difficult for the child to be very cooperative as well as the parents will uh, not be able to understand and they will not be able to convince the child. So that is why most of the bracing treatments, it is uh, not being followed very diligently because of these uh, practical reasons. And whenever the curve is greater than 40 degree, even if the child is skeletally mature, we have to go ahead with surgical treatment. The concept of waiting if the curve is greater than 40 degrees doesn't work. Even if the child is skeletally mature, it is better to go ahead with surgery because by the time it becomes skeletally mature, this 40 degree curve will become 80 degree and it will be very difficult to correct at that point of time. And it is not like before, like in the past two decades, the treatment of scoliosis has improved significantly. There is n number of treatment methods like growing rods, magic rods and everything. So that child can be treated without any major complications. Now coming to skeletal mature, the same thing holds on good. 20 to 40 degrees observation. Orthosis is not required if the child is skeletal mature because as I said, when the child is skeletally mature, the chances of progression becomes very less. But over greater than 40 or 50 degree, the child requires surgery. So this is a, the growth rod technique. You are, you, you are just going to use two rods and you will tend to, the spine will tend to grow along the rod just like a train growing, I mean, going along the railway track. So the spine is being guided by growth rod. This is a technique which is commonly used in skeletally immature children. So what are the risk factors for progression? So girls, premenarchal, rises grade 0 or 1, double or triple curves, severe curves, they are all risk factors for progression. And this is uh, an image of brace. So you can see uh, this, this is called as the Boston brace. It has to be custom made. Now coming to 
the fixation surgery as such the general principle is as i said all the major curves and all the structural curves should be fused and non structural minor curves can be allowed to correct spontaneously after fusion of the structural curve so this is in nutshell about the treatment so basically you are going to do multiple level osteotomies you are going to you are going to break the spine into various parts and with guided instrumentation system you are going to insert something called as pedical screws and using your maneuvers you are going to correct the rotational deformity and translational deformity now coming back to the example so this is the intraoperative image of this child as you can see the screws have been put in in, a, in the grossly deformed spine and after that i usually put a rod and then use something called as rod towers or reduction devices and then you reduce the rod to the screws and try to cantilever it and get to the appropriate alignment so this is the post operative picture you have to put adequate amount of bone graft for the spine to fuse so the ultimate aim is the entire spine to be fused in this corrected position so this is the post operative image from about 100 degree curve the curve was reduced to 31 degrees and usually uh, uh neuro monitoring is mandatorily uh, mandatory and i use neuro monitoring for all my cases of deformity correction it is an uh, intraoperative monitoring device wherein you can see whether there is any uh drop in the signals when you are trying to correct deformity and having said that any patient with scoliosis the moment you diagnose scoliosis the next investigation which you have to write is mri spine because even in idiopathic scoliosis the chances of spinal dystrophism and or, or other associated spinal anomalies is about 10 to 20% so we should not miss that so this is the pre operative image of the child and this is the post operative image the child standing straight with almost level or balanced shoulders and the child gains 6 cm of height after the procedure last two slides about congenital scoliosis as i said it could be because of failure of formation or failure of segmentation because of some anomalies or embryogenic uh, issues the treatment principles it can be divided into prevention of future deformity in case of small segment scoliosis you go ahead do in situ fusion and when you want correction of deformity there are various modalities of treatment it could be a gradual correction as i mentioned like growth rods magic rods or vector or acute correction of deformity usually in cases of hemi vertebra only one vertebra in which shape you go remove that vertebra fuse it and fix it and do it the most uh, uh, complicated or uh, challenging type of scoliosis is neuromuscular scoliosis here our only aim should be to achieve sitting balance so that the child is able to sit or use wheelchair because most of the children who come with neuromuscular scoliosis will be uh, it will be gross scoliosis the child will not be able to sit or uh, bed care for the child will be very difficult so our aim should be that instead of aiming for full correction which is not warranted so it usually requires long segment fixation with multiple fixation techniques the pedicles will be very dysplastic so the screws may not hold so you should have sublaminar wires the normal amount of bone grafting should be uh, the bone grafting for this type of scoliosis should be twice or thrice than normal cases and you should suspect increased perioperative complications so to conclude adolescent idiopathic scoliosis is the commonest type school screening is very very vital and we are coming up with that and it can pick up children at an early age and multiple treatment options are available based on the type of severity of the curve and creating awareness and reassuring parents is very very vital uh, as physicians we are supposed to do that and scoliosis is one condition where the proper prevention is better than cure doesn't hold a uh, good so early diagnosis and prompt treatment is the key and by doing this we will be able to uh, tackle not only the physical deformity but also the emotional and mental trauma that the kid as well as the parents are going on nandri thank you very much dr sudhir for covering uh, for covering a very vast topic and uh, easily uh, understandable slides are there any questions from the audience